a knight, a dancer, a demon, and a bear man. Today I want to tell you the stories about the four nameless mausoleum bosses in the DLC and talk about their stories and how they're actually more similar than you might think. Let's start with one of the first significant challenges you'll actually face when entering the Shadow of the Erd Tree DLC, the Black Jail Knight. For many players, this encounter was quite a brutal introduction to the DLC's difficulty. You've been exploring this eerie new area, getting a feel for the dangers, when you stumble across an underground tomb. Suddenly, you're face to face with a juggernaut, a heavily armoured, great sword wielding foe who strikes calf across the narrow room with a rapid fire crossbow that riddles you with bolts if you attempt to put any distance between you two. Not that there's really much room to work with here, the fighting space is incredibly tight. So who is this mysterious figure? Well, let's start with his armour. The polished and imposing Solitude set. In its description, this character is referred to as the Knight of the Solitary Jail. If you've played the DLC when it first dropped, you'll know him as the Black Jail Knight like I've introduced him, whether his name was actually patched to Knight of the Solitary Jail, likely to align better with his item descriptions which repeatedly reference solitude and isolation, but not the colour black. Perhaps Black Jail Knight was a placeholder name left over from development, only to be updated after the DLC launched. I have to admit though, Black Jail Knight does have a certain appeal, maybe that's because I'm used to calling him that. Back to Solitude. The description of the Knight's greatsword offers us some insight into his life. It reads, Through a secret rite, they relinquished their hearts, a heightened battle prowess. Next, they engraved their blades with two crests, one depicting the light of birth, and the other, solitude. Giving up your heart for power, imagine the lonely existence that must bring. Encased in thick, unyielding armour, they become an impenetrable wall, cut off from all feeling, an actual fortress of solitude. Let's touch on something that From Software fans love to do, speculating on berserk references. Does the Knight of the Solitary Jail resemble Guts? There are some undeniable parallels here, particularly Guts's berserker armour. Both are heavy, overlapping metal plates draped in a dark cloak, and their faces obscured by intimidating helms. That said, the helms are pretty different. Guts's helm has sharp, animalistic features, while the knight's is fortified and almost prison-like, as if it were the iron bars of a jail itself. But what about underneath? Well, we can't actually see what he looks like this way, and you know why? Because he's wearing armour that blocks everything from view. The legendary Express VPN set, sponsor of today's video. Express VPN shields your data, so even the all-seeing internet service providers who love to log and sell your browsing data to ad companies are kept at bay. Online privacy is crucial for me. No one needs to see what I'm searching for when I'm doing research for these law videos. ExpressVPN grants you a powerful veil, encrypting and rerouting 100% of your network traffic through secure servers, ensuring ISPs can't record or sell your activity. If you're using public Wi-Fi, like at a coffee shop or an airport, hackers can easily gain access to your emails, passwords, and even your credit card details. But with ExpressVPN, it wraps your internet traffic in an encrypted, shielded tunnel, so your online time is much more anonymous and secure, even on unsecured Wi-Fi. There have been times where I've not been inside at home, I know, shocker, and I need to make some absolutely necessary purchases, but I only have random public Wi-Fi to use. ExpressVPN also works on your phone to provide the best in-class encryption so not even Mikola the kind can charm his way in. It's super easy to use, literally just a tap to turn it on, super fast speeds making them consistently faster than any other VPN provider and they use trusted server technology, so it's physically impossible for their VPN servers to store any of your logs. Right now, you can take advantage of ExpressVPN's Black Friday Cyber Monday offer to get the absolute best VPN deal you'll find all year. Find out more by scanning this QR code, or use my special link in the description to get four extra months with the 12-month plan, or six extra months with the 24-month plan totally free. Just go to expressvpn.com slash chalice to get an extra four or even six months of ExpressVPN for free. Thank you ExpressVPN. Now, back to the lore. It's not just about looks, their armors share a deeper purpose. 
The solitude armor is centered around sacrificing the heart for power. While we don't know how literal this exchange is in Elden Ring, it does mirror Guts's berserk armor, which numbs him to pain, making him nearly oblivious to injury. He describes it as beyond bothering him, as if it simply doesn't matter anymore. In a way, it's as if he too has surrendered his heart, becoming detached from any sensation that might hold him back. With this detachment, Guts and the Knight of the Solitary Jail can reach an almost superhuman level of strength and reflexes. Then there's the Knight's fighting style. Wielding a massive greatsword, he does mirror Guts' own Dragonslayer sword, both weapons with dark obsidian cores and lighter steel edges. The Knight's weapon skill, Solitary Moonslash, creates an arc of force or light that resembles the brutal sweeping swings that Guts does. And if you still aren't convinced of the connection, here's one more detail. Under his helmet, you find out that the Knight of the Solitary Jail does have a vertical scar across his nose, a mark eerily similar to one of Guts's first scars received in his childhood. With all these nods, the Knight of the Solitary Jail is likely a tribute to Guts, the Black Swordsman, which could also explain why he was once called the Black Jail Knight. However, there are ways in which the Knight is his own character, distinct from any outside inspiration. One being the detail of the crests engraved on his sword. The description tells us that knights engrave their blade with two crests, one depicting the light of birth and the other solitude. While it doesn't specify which is which, I would say that the simpler lonely orb is the symbol for solitude and the more elaborate design to represent the brilliance of birth. These same symbols appear on the knight's chestplate. I'm not too sure about the purpose of the crests and what they're meant to represent really, but it could be that they serve as a reminder for these knights, a memory of what they are fighting for. It could mirror the Erd Tree and the Shadow Tree, the former an emblazoned beacon of light and life, and the latter as a muted consequence of solitude. The Amaset has some more insight onto the background of the knights and their world. It goes on to say, the nameless mausoleums of the realm of shadow are said to hold the spirits of warriors who lost their names or their hearts. Losing one's heart isn't exactly the same as giving it up voluntarily. We'll come back to this idea with the other spirits I'm going to talk about in this video, but for now it's worth noting that these are the spirits of the deceased, warriors without hearts, without names, but still continue to fight after death. This brings us to our next character, the Dancer of Rana. When I first saw her teased in the trailer, oh my god, beautiful red dress contrasting with this field of blue flowers, doing her little blade dance, absolute cinema. So when the DLC finally dropped, I couldn't wait to find her. I scoured through the Cerulean coast, searching for any sign. Where was she? When was she going to pop up and fight me? To my disappointment, they did stick her in an underground mausoleum as a spirit, so we missed out on seeing the full splendour of her red dress. Perhaps that trailer was more of a showcase of the new armour and weapons, but still, we were robbed. As I said, this mausoleum is on a secret island amongst the beautiful blue flowers of the Cerulean coast. And the fight is pretty spectacular. You get this all new fighting style to counter, the unending dance. Spinning and twirling, the dancer seems to slash at you elegantly forever. And in theory, this is what she must do. The dance of Rana is one of burning passion, and the most passionate dancers never allow their fiery dance to end, losing even their names as they dance on. To see the passion fade is to see the dancer's flame extinguished. Here we get a callback to our encounter with the knight. This dancer has also lost something, a name. From whirling and twirling endlessly, she lost herself to the dance. The red of her dress, the fiery passion, and even literal fire. If the dancer is not using her blade to attack you in the fight, she will bring her hands together and unleash literal flames. This is likely due to the flammable perfume oil that dancers keep concealed on their person, marking the height of their passion with an explosion of searing flame and sweet, enticing scents. This colourful spice dance may remind you of a specific character from the base game, Tanith. Long ago, when Rikard first set eyes on Tanith, she was working as a dancer in a foreign land. Soon he made her his consort. 
we can now assume this foreign land is Rana, wherever that may be. So Tanith was a dancer of Rana, just like this enemy in the mausoleum. Even more support for this theory is the little extra lore item in the game sold by Patches. Castanets used by dancers from foreign lands. The passionate dance comprises no seductiveness, but merely a dignified beauty. Sounds very similar to the endless dance we have seen. And for the final nail in the dancer's coffin, so to speak, the face data for the dancer of Rana is practically identical to Tanith's face if you remove her mask. Illustrated really well here by Zalowski, it's possible they are not the same person, but likely very closely related. Dance comes up multiple times as a theme in the DLC. You have the expansion on the dancers of Rana, you have the cavorting dance of the Divine Beasts, and the blood-spilling, self-flagellating dances of the Curse Blades. Now speaking of blood, let's go to our next character, Rakshasa. Much like the dancer of Rana, Rakshasa is also a slave to a repeating cycle. She resides in the Eastern Nameless Mausoleum, and if her description is anything to go by, she is also a ruthless warrior. Soaked in the spurting blood of her victims, tatters of ragged cloth jut out haphazardly, as if her lust for carnage threatens to break free. Her armour set is incredible, a contrasting blend of solid, imposing plate, with the ragged fabric scraps all drenched in bloodstains, it's both beautiful and terrifying. Hearing blood soaked might remind you of the infamous incident in the Land of Reeds mentioned in the base game. We know that a civil war devastated the region, the entire nation succumbed to blood soaked madness. Despite warriors like Yura and Okina escaping the Land of Reeds, bloodshed continued to follow them. Take Okina, for example. He ultimately struck a pact with Moog, dedicating himself to the life of a demon whose thirst would never go unsated. Wielding his infamous rivers of blood katana, felling countless foes wherever he went, how does this relate to Rakshasa? Well, like Okina, she's not only drenched in blood, but so is her blade. Stained red with blood from her relentless slaying, Rakshasa's great katana, who cuts down and devours. In many ways, she's more than just a bloodthirsty warrior, she's practically a demon herself. And that makes sense when you consider her name. Rakshasa originates from Hindu mythology, describing a demon capable of changing forms. Rakshasas are known to shift their appearances, sometimes into animals, terrifying monsters, or even beautiful women. In Elden Ring beneath her helm, Rakshasa could easily fit the description of the latter. The name also might sound familiar to those who know Forgotten Realms. In D&D, Rakshasas are usually depicted as tiger-headed humanoids who like the finer things in life. However, they are considered to be the embodiment of evil, immortal fiendish spirits exploiting the guise of flesh for political gain, influence and deceit. So with this in mind, is the character in Elden Ring simply sharing the name Rakshasa? Or is she a vessel of a demon? The last line of her armour description seems to hint at the answer. Cut down and devour. Only those who repeat the cycle without rest can truly subvert the self and become Rakshasa. This line suggests that Rakshasa isn't just a name, it's a title, a state of being to be earned. Only by spilling blood without mercy again and again does one earn the right to become Rakshasa. This idea aligns with Rakshasas of Hindu mythology, described as insatiable man-eaters who feed on human flesh. Here it is the same, devour, consume, repeat. In Rakshasa, we see yet another character lost to a cycle of obsession, like the knight who's driven to give up his heart for power, or the dancer who twirls herself into madness forgetting her name, Rakshasa is bound to her own relentless repetition. All these characters so far have lost their names and their identities to the cycle, yet here this vessel gains a new one, transforming into a blood-soaked demon. To become Rakshasa is to subvert the self and lose all traces of what once was. This brings us to our final character, another soul whose name is lost to the madness of the nameless mausoleums. He's known only as Red Bear. You encounter this hulking figure clad in a thick rugged bear pelt in the northern nameless mausoleum. His fighting style is nothing short of primal. 
He slashes at you with his claws, slamming and tearing with the ferocity of a beast. At one point, he even lets out a bellowing roar, and as he does so, an apparition of a massive bear's head rises above him. This skill channels the strength of Rugalea, the great red bear, and it is humorously called Bear Communion. This is a tongue-in-cheek comparison to Dragon Communion, which has a much more considerable cult following around it, with multiple churches and a repertoire of incantations that grant transformative powers, allowing you to embody aspects of dragons. However, the Bear Communion is much more new and primal and unrefined, referred to as more akin to divine invocation of the horn scent, something deeply animalistic. Like the crucible theme spells that bestow wings or tails, this communion grants the strength and roar a bear. So how did Red Bear come by these unique powers? We learn only through desperate battle with the feral wild can one discover a god unique to oneself. Our Red Bear NPC encountered some kind of bear god after his brutal fight with one. He made some kind of connection, perhaps in a way that you consume a dragon heart to unlock dragon communion, he ate a bear heart. And another prize for his victory was the pelt of Relva, the name of the bear he defeated, which he now wears across his head and back as his own. This untreated hide, one at the end of a bloody bout, is just the thing to make a wild bear out of a warrior. By defeating the powerful Relva, he wears its skin to show both his strength and the bear's strength, becoming one and the same. He wears this iron rivet armour that also hints at his transformation and once again the loss of identity. A warrior whose name is lost to madness. After killing the great red bear in a blood-soaked bout, he became fascinated by the untainted glory of its naked strength. I wish to be a bear, no more and no less. Red Bear's respect for this creature is so great that he wished to live and fight just as it had done. This is why when you face him, he wields no blade or shield, only the raw power of the claws and roars of a bear. Nothing more, nothing less. Interestingly, we do get a glimpse into Red Bear's life before he became the bear-like warrior we know today. His helmet, specifically the cheek guards, are shaped after lion's fangs. Perhaps his fascination with the untamed strength of the wild stemmed from his past as a red mane. For context, the red manes are General Radan's loyal army, and their emblem is a lion. Radan himself has always been in touch with his animal side. He once declared, I was born a champion's cub, now I am the lord of the battlefield's lion. The choice of the word cub here is also interesting because it usually refers to a lion's young, but it could also mean the young of a bear. Having previously served a furiously red-haired lion general, it seems fitting that Red Bear would go on to embrace something very similar, worshipping the red-haired bears found in the Land of Shadow. In losing his name and embracing this feral path, he kept the heart of a lion, just now within the form of a bear. Thank you everybody so much for watching if you made it this far through the video. I wanted to touch on some smaller short story topics today for Elden Ring. And if you like this style of content, please let me know as well. I will be continuing with the Elden Ring DLC, but there's actually some other games I started to want to talk about as well. So I hope you look forward to lore on some different games and I appreciate your patience while I figure out talking about something that's not Elden Ring. That's been a while. Thank you so much if you made it this far. A special thank you to my channel members and patrons and I'll see you later. Bye guys.